Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rob Martirana, and I'm here with Jeff Miller, Ed Stavetsky, um, Mark Gerstein, and hopefully uh, Brian Gamartin is on the way. And we're going to discuss how 6 p.m. Uh, read the news. We're hopefully going to give you some advice on how to read the news more effectively. And I'm hoping that you all have the slide deck in front of you. Uh, first off, I did want to give my thanks to Bright Talk and to Regina Yulo in particular for hosting this, and to Will Ortel. I had to give him a shout out. Will Ortel is at the CFA Institute, and he's the one who originally worked with me on this article some seven months ago. Um, this is the fruit of quite a few hours of uh, interviews and research, so I hope you enjoy it. And the genesis of it was simply that I had a very hard time reading the news and keeping up. So I decided to ask uh, some of my friends, and they were on the line, how they read the news because I wanted to figure out how to do it more effectively. Um, these are the uh, speakers, and this is the order that we'll generally follow. And uh, I think I introduced uh, everybody in general. As for me and my background, I've been in the business 30 years. I think everyone in the line, um, all, all six of us, including Anonymous, have been in the business 30 years or more, so that's kind of our perspective. We'll try to keep it general so that everybody can benefit from it. Um, and if we talk too much inside baseball, uh, please shoot us some feedback on the screen. And uh, keep in mind, we will try to keep the last 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so look on the right side of your screen, and I believe you have a box there where you can give feedback and questions from the audience. Um, uh, my background, you know, I've been a stock analyst, uh, head of a hedge fund website, head of uh, equity research at Barclays, lots of interesting stuff over the years. And currently, I have a small RIA in New Jersey, and I do a lot of consulting for the asset management industry. Uh, so let's go through, let's start with how I read the news. And this is a very, very quick take. Uh, hopefully, you can see my screen or, or see the slide where I just have to show some bookmarks. Some people use, use feed readers to accomplish this. Um, I use bookmarks at the top of the screen with little tiny icons so I can just cover a lot of uh, websites. Um, you know, pretty rapidly. But the key that I wanted to go through is that, and, and just to frame this out, because someone else gave me feedback on this, I'm assuming that everybody who's reading the financial news has opinions and positions in the market. And you already know what you own, you already know what you like, what you're bullish and bearish on. So when you read the financial news, you're looking for things that either confirm or conflict with your main thesis. That's the purpose of reading the financial news, to discover, to learn, um, and perhaps to change your mind. You're reading it to make better decisions. As part of it, for general news, I wanted to keep this simple. I look at the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and compare it to Google front news just to get a sense of who's covering what. And what's most interesting about that, I think, is simply the story selection for page one. Um, I look at the PDFs. For this exercise, I look at the PDFs because they're fixed in time. They represent an editorial decision about what is printed on the front page of the newspaper, and that's locked in. And that is something uh, – sorry about that. The slides drifted forward. Uh, that's kind of locked in, and it gives you something um, something that you know you can um, – you can lock into. Sorry, sorry to pause there. I'm getting a couple of questions about the slides. Apparently, they are loaded up, and you can see them as we go through, but they are not available for download yet. They'll be available for download after the call. Uh, Bright Talk handles that, and it's out of my control. So um, I hope, uh, hope you can bear with me as we go through the slides. Please uh, accept my apologies about that. I thought they were available already. In any case, key point there is that you fixate on um, what is the front page of the Wall Street Journal, or New York Times, or whatever the major other news sites, Financial Times, Washington Post, or we, could, we could give a whole long list. What I was looking for as one method of interpretation is what is the story selection? What is the top story in each? What is the angle? Where do they overlap? If it's straight news on employment, there are many, many ways to read employment numbers. And I'll leave it to Jeff Miller to dissect that because he can, he can do a far better job than I. And I just want to say, uh, Mark, I do think we're getting a lot of breath noise on the line. It, um, and I'm picking on you for no reason in particular. It's one of us. Um, so if, um, 
if you're breathing right into the phone, it, it's uh, creating background noise. Uh, Might be an air conditioner. Maybe it's, ah, blame the air conditioner. That must be it. Well, if it's if it's anybody else, uh, please don't uh, breathe into the line, or if you have wind noise, everybody in the line can hear that. Um, point here, and I'm going to have to move on, is sometimes a story will defy the political leanings of a website. Uh, in the article I wrote, one of the examples I gave was on minimum wage and fair wages and inequality. Typically, the New York Times will play that up you know, week after week. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, very different take. Obviously, it's a conservative newspaper, so it reflects that. When you see a story that defies the political leanings of a website or a news media site, that's interesting because it says that a story is breaking through somehow the traditional left-right narrative. That's something you want to pay attention to. Uh, it, it takes a long time to play out. The minimum wage one, we were talking, Brian and I were talking, geez, I don't know, a couple of... Uh, a couple of months, no, a year ago. And it, it took a full year before you actually saw it in the earnings of restaurants and retailers that there was some wage pressure from the bottom. Um, I want to move on because we have a lot of material to cover, and I want to give time to uh, Jeff and Mark and, and Ed. Um, some of the sources I use, and this will be available afterwards, uh, Y charts, um, fund, factor, fund analysis by factors, um, we don't have enough time to go into details about uh, how to use each of these. But one that I really, something that I learned from this exercise of interviewing other portfolio managers was on my uh, personal to-do list. And Mark Gerstein is the one who, who mentioned the FRED dashboard. Great tool. I didn't know about it. I have 15 charts on my dashboard for client presentations. You just hit a button and it downloads it into a PowerPoint. Incredibly convenient and useful. And uh, Mark will talk later about the reason you emphasize charts and data over narratives. Narratives are misleading. Numbers, better place to start. Um, Twitter search and feed reader, also uh, good tools. You know, um, and hopefully you get a chance to use those. I'm going to move on. I, I believe uh, Brian has joined us. Um, and I just want to double check. Excellent. And uh, Brian G. Martin, just uh, by way of background, if, if you wouldn't mind, Brian, talking a little bit about your background and um, any comments about the, uh, the little group or little advisor network, it'd be welcome just to provide some context. You want me to do that now, Rob? Yeah, if you don't mind. And then uh, I, your slide is up. Oh, um, <clears throat> great. My background is I started in the business in the late 80s, early 90s as a uh, municipal credit analyst. And uh, I worked at a, a broker, small broker dealer in Chicago, and then I worked at a mutual fund firm on the buy side and uh, worked for portfolio managers and, and um, both mutual funds and, and uh, insurance managers. And then um, I went out on my own in 1995 and have been there since, been out on my own since, and uh, mainly running balance accounts for uh, individuals. So uh, the group, I think, is, is great. I hope uh, everybody on the call that's listening gets to be a part of it. It's, uh, it's you know, we talk about time, not only timely topics, but we delve into things like, um, you know, accounting and, and uh, economics. Jeff Miller is a, gives a great perspective uh, on, on economic data, which is much better than what you're going to read or, or hear about in the press every day. So, um, yeah, the group is, is well worth the time and effort. And uh, Brian, if you wouldn't mind, uh, some of the things that you'd mentioned, uh, briefing.com and so on, I, I would really like to hear more about most about earnings because that's on fundamental, fundamental as your blog. You spend a lot of time on that, and it's, it always amazes me because the work that you do is accessible publicly, and very few people take advantage of it. Now, you do it consistently, and you know that's what's required. You can't just dabble in it. So if you could talk a little bit about how you use FactSet and Thomson Reuters, uh, that would be great. Sure. Um, I've been a subscriber to Thomson Reuters, Rob, um, since probably early 2000, um, maybe a little after, maybe mid-2000. And um, I needed a more uh, statistical – I was looking for a more statistical quantitative way to make investment decisions 
um, relative to to just being growth value, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Thompson puts out a, a, a what they call this week in earnings every week, which basically gives breaks down the ten sectors of the S and P 500 by expected growth uh, growth rates, percentage growth rates, and <clears throat> facts that's a little bit different. Uh, there, you know, John Butters who actually started the facts that group. I, I believe was hired by FAXA from Thompson Reuters. Well, I know he was. I know he came from Thompson Reuters because I talked to him in the early 2000s. But I think he was specifically hired by FAXA to get the earnings, get that earnings operation up and running. So basically, FAXA and Thompson are are pretty similar, except for Thompson Reuters gives uh, expected growth rates by se- sector. FAXA does things a little bit differently. They're a little bit less um, quantitative in terms of the forward information. Um, for instance, uh, the, one of the reasons, you know, Jeff Miller and I have had this debate. Um, one of the reasons I like Thompson is because they'll lay out the next five quarters for you in terms of expected uh, growth rates for each sector of the S&P 500, and then they update it every week. So, so as I've told readers, it's, it's, it's – uh, not really that important to see the actual dollar estimate per sector, but what you're doing is you're looking for relative changes both between the sectors and you're also looking for absolute changes, uh, meaning, you know, growth rates that are going from 10 to 15 percent or um, growth rates that go from negative to positive like earn it, like energy is about to do. And then you also look for, um, you know, you look for changes in the patterns and that's really you know the key thing in in late 2012 i i suggested that the readers if they were interested would go would overweight financials simply because as as we move from august through september through october the expected 2013 growth rate for financials stopped declining and that's a major that's a major green light so um because normally as you move through the year towards the forward quarters, the estimates, there's always downward pressure on estimates. So just the fact that estimates might stop declining for forward quarters is a sign that analysts are turning more positive, which is what they're doing now. If you look at the 2017 numbers, you're seeing much much fewer revisions for 2017, and, either for, and also for you know, the fourth quarter of 2016. So even though there's downward pressure on them, it's much less than it, than it is normally as I've done this over the years. So you're, it's really kind of a nuanced analysis, and I share it with readers, you know, and they're welcome to, they're welcome to follow it in terms of the investing, uh, you know, the investing style or the investing discipline, or they can just use it for additional information. So, you know, I don't think, I don't think that many people focus on it, and it is a wealth of information provided by both Thompson and, and, um, fax that for free. I mean, you can get the info for free. You just have to have the patience and discipline to update it. Uh, and that, that, that always amazed me. No, that does, Brian. It always amazed me because, like you said, it's it's not just free, but it's authoritative. Uh, you know, now they're doing it for free because they want to upsell to other products that can add value, but the base products are so good and provide, uh, you know, a format to understand when people just talk, especially strategists are especially prone to do this, they'll talk about S&P earnings, like in, this, in the aggregate. And they'll pass over, you know, the sector trends, the geographic trends. Uh, they'll just – and this information is available for free. And it, it, it kind of boggles my mind that either they don't know about it or they don't have time to do it. Um, and one of the things that you do that I like, and, and the quote we have on the slide here – you know, I publish for myself. It forces me to organize my thoughts. And you're better at this than I am. I, I got to give a tip of the hat to you because you're very consistent in publishing and following it along. And that's really, whether it's, you know, 50 words or 500 words, that discipline and that consistency of looking through the numbers week by week is where the value is generated. And then you can start to disagree with the market, with consensus, with conviction. Um, I hope I'm phrasing that right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's Jeff. Can I add a comment here too? Please. So what, if I had to pick the single most important thing about Brian's work, 
he talks about forward earnings, which get a lot of bad commentary because everyone says that they're too optimistic and we know they're going to come down, which, of course, Brian writes about. Then at the time the earnings are actually announced, everybody says the bar is set too low, and so the beat rate is deceptive. Now, it'll be the same people saying both things. So if you think about that, (laughs) somewhere along the line, those forward estimates had to be accurate. So that's why when Brian does his detailed estimates, and shows us turning points, and especially turning points by sector, it's extremely valuable, and people have to go beyond these conventional wisdom statements and look at the data. Thank you, Jeff. And that's Jeff Miller, by the way, um, for people who don't know Jeff's by voice. I found, it's like anything else, Rob. It's, um, you know, I, I listen to people on CNBC and Bloomberg Daily, and if they're bear, if they're bullish, they can use earnings. If they're bearish, they can use earnings. You know, S and P 500 earnings are like the three, the proverbial three blind men and the elephant. You know, it's you can find whatever you're looking for, or or the or the you know you can call it a Rorschach test. And and you know, it's I've 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 also written on the blog about where earnings have been misleading relative to a market. You know, and the most famous one was July of 2008. It's, um, earnings peaked, you know, the S&P 500, that forward earnings estimate that Jeff just mentioned, it peaked in, on July 23rd of 2008. And it, what it did was, you know, it, it came down precipit- precipitously after that. But it was, um, I realized that it doesn't do a good job of evaluating systemic risk. You know, like the kind that, like the kind that uh, September and October, um, you know, resulted in. So, it is just one metric, and I've you know I've learned, and as I've I've done it week after week for 15 years now, or 16 years now, it's it is a very nuanced process, and you have to you know it's like anything else, it's like a doctor or lawyer, you have to know when to override the override the signals and be cautious or or be more aggressive and you know and i try and bring that out on the blog but you know i think we're in a great investing environment you know i think we're in the middle of a new bull market and i think we've been there a while and it's the sentiment is just amazing to me the negative sentiment but anyway i won't get off the topic but uh thank you for asking me to talk about it and you know for listeners who are on uh, the, the website is www.fundamentalist.com or just uh, Google Trinity Asset Management, and you'll get to the blog. So thank you. No, thank you, Brian. And, uh, you know, feel free to chime in later during the call. We're going to um, – I like having an interactive, um, you know, discussion amongst the, the team. And, by the way, this is the Advisor Network. This is a private uh, network I, run, I moderate. And uh, that's pretty much what we do. We, we sit around and uh, talk and respectfully disagree um, sometimes not so respectfully. Um, but anyway, next up, um, and Jeff Miller's coming up in a moment, but I wanted, this is, uh, uh, your slide now shows anonymous, and this uh, this person didn't get compliance clearance to appear on the call. Um, and I was joking with somebody that he has to wear a Chewbacca mask when he speaks in public. So <laughs> just, you know, that's how compliance is. Um, his suggestion, which I really liked, was that when you get white paper, and we all get a lot of them, and you stumble across all this stuff, and finance articles, and book reviews, and all this long-form stuff that you want to read, he said, look, I keep folders, I put them in folders, and then once a week I'll go through and I dedicate four hours, shut the door, it's on my calendar, and I read through this stuff. And if I read five articles on the investment process, let's say stock selection techniques for value, or it could be the economy um, inflation prediction methods, Whatever it is, wherever it falls, it could be on, on picking fund managers, third-party fund managers. That's a much, much more fruitful way to read than the scattershot stuff that we're tempted to because it keeps you away from one end. You could just jump from light to light, and you just float along the headlines reading whatever comes across in the last five minutes. But on the other hand, you can't spend all day reading, doing the deep scuba diving stuff, you know, because you do have to keep up with the basic news. That's just part of the business. So I thought that was a, a very, um, very interesting um, 
tool there or tip from Anonymous. Uh, now I'm going to go to Jeff, and Jeff is going to get a disproportionate amount of time because he's done so much work on this topic. Um, I have to say he, he did this way before I did. Um, you know, just the whole idea of reading the news with a critical eye. Um, so, Jeff, if you don't mind, we have uh, your first slide up. If you could give us a little bit of background on yourself, um, you know, for people who don't know you uh, or your firm. Okay. Well, like others, I've been in the financial business uh, since October 1st, 1987. How was my timing? <laughs> Good time. I started out at uh, one of the firms that made markets, floor traders at the Chicago Options Exchange, doing quant work and research for them. And I'm going to go back just a little before that because it's relevant to what I do. My first career was as a college professor. I taught at the University of Wisconsin. I did a lot of consulting for state and municipal governments in Wisconsin, including the city of Milwaukee, and I uh, was on loan to the Department of Revenue for a while. So I did a lot of quantitative modeling on the Wisconsin tax system and, uh, you know, at deep roots as a quant guy and interested in economics as well as uh, political science and public policy issues. So the guys in Chicago, when they brought me in, they said, okay, we want some of this modeling done on individual stocks. And so I did a lot of research on options, you value, on options valuation and um, uh, volatility forecasting and the like. So then about uh, in the late 90s, I had started doing some consulting for various traders I think at one point or another I've advised traders on each of the different Chicago trading floors. And uh, my partner and I decided that we could do better if we started providing services directly to individuals. And so uh, we started Newark Investments where we uh, basically custody at a firm but trade individual accounts in one of several programs that we've developed. So reading the news is a big source of edge uh, for us, and it, it's kind of ironic. The first slide here says you don't get paid for yesterday's news. Well, of course, some people do get paid for discussing yesterday's news. They have a salary, and that's what they do. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how smart you can sound when you already know what the score of the game was, and then you can offer your interpretation of what happened. But when I say you don't get paid for it, I mean we as investors – uh, don't get paid for following what people are telling us after the fact. And one of the pundits I call the pundit-in-chief seems to do this uh, twice a day, once in the morning and uh, once in the afternoon. And it, it's just amazing how the interpretation of what's happening shifts with the winds. So uh, if you click through the article I have on that, you can see that I talk about what some of the people have done. We have people who are famous for being famous, who get out and make dramatic uh, predictions. And you, you have to refute this somehow. And the way you refute it is, first, if you have actual data, then you have to do a superior interpretation of the data. And you also need to look at uh, some sources that other people don't pay attention to. So I read a lot of things in science and health research. And what I'm looking for is a contrarian bet. It, you don't find edge by piling into crowded trades. So it's fine to look at what worked the best last year. You know, if you wanted to beat the market last year, you were in FANG stocks or you bought utilities and so forth. But do we really think those are the best positions for the coming year? I mean, they're, they're dangerously – so you have to have a contrarian attitude, but also a method of evaluation. So what kind of information do you actually need? Um, and I have another link in there for information you need and do not get where um, – I, I basically <laughs> I have this picture of Paul Lind, who was famous for being famous, and uh, some people probably don't even remember him. 
But there also are people that are on all the time just because they have made a connection somehow with the producers at CNBC or they've made themselves available all the time for interviews. And so you see them over and over again, and then when you look at their credentials, <clears throat> the credentials say something like widely quoted. He's been appeared on or been quoted in all these different places. So the credential is that he knows some producers. What I try to do, <clears throat> what, I, what I'm trying to do is look for people who are the best in each of their fields. And here is where my uh, experience in quantitative work and in economics comes in handy. I, I don't personally do all of the economics research, but I'm good enough to know good economic work when I see it. And I don't personally develop models anymore, but I know how to judge the people who are real experts in developing models and pick those that don't hit the obvious traps. So the skill of picking what is valid is a good way of, um, of being contrarian and having an edge, uh, having an edge while you're doing it. Um, I think the and worst. Yeah. If I could uh, jump in, uh, Jeff, just to, um, we're getting a lot of questions about the slides again. I just want to let people know that the links that Jeff is talking about are on the PDF, and it will be available after the call, and you'll be able to click through any of the articles that he's mentioning. Um, and I do have other questions that are coming in, and we'll answer them at the end of the call. Sorry to interrupt you, Jeff. You were, you were talking about information you well, need. I'm, you I'm sorry that uh, uh, I don't the, – the particular links do provide a little bit more information about the themes I'm discussing. And so if people are interested in the theme, they might – like going back and looking at uh, some of the past work. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think is the biggest market theme right now, which is uh, the biggest misinformation, which is recession forecasting. Now, whenever there is a, whenever there is a um, possible weakness in the economy, everybody has an opinion about whether or not we're going into a recession, and a lot of people benefit from predicting recessions. Uh, if you are trying to attract people to your website, you benefit. If you have, a, if you're a political candidate, you benefit. And by, and I don't mean any particular party. What I mean is whoever is out in uh, of office wants to criticize somehow the people who are in office. Uh, that's what Obama did back in 2008. Of course, it's just natural. So we get bombarded with this kind of information. And the leading expert firm on recession forecasting had a pretty good real-time record until 2011. Um, unfortunately, what they use is a black box. We don't really know what the forecasting elements are, although some of my friends in another discussion group have kind of reverse engineered it. And I know they have a lot of different uh, commodity indicators. Like many people who are traders, they don't like government data because it gets revised. Well, this is kind of strange in my mind since it gets revised when it gets better and they have more information. Uh, market data, of course, doesn't get revised. The price of something on a given day doesn't, but the market certainly changes direction as it gets more information. So what happens is you get a fall in prices and that fall in prices to much of the world signals that we're about to have a recession. Well, if you take the, what happened this year, the reason was the fall in oil prices. But the fall in oil prices did not reflect lower demand. It reflected increased supply. So, the, you know, the entire conception of commodity prices predicting a recession was wrong. And if you bet on that, you just missed several years of rally. You lost a lot of money by missing mm -hmm. several years of rally. Uh, there are objective standards for forecasting recessions, and a, one of the keys is that you don't have over 100 variables. You do it with you don't look for perfection, and you do it with a few variables. One way I spot a bad model is if it's too perfect. Uh, <laughs> 
too perfect. It just means that whoever's done it has really overfit it. So uh, I think, you know, we still have a lot of stocks that are at recession prices, even though the market is at a new high. So I'm kind of looking for a sector shift from some of these utility-type sectors into some that have a higher cyclical quality. Uh, the Fed and QE, I don't we, – we, we could do a couple of full programs on this. I'm just going to comment that it is another source for um, political polarization right now. And in economics, a lot of things happen at exactly the same time. And so you can put up a two-variable chart and say, look, these things happen together. And um, – and it can seem very convincing. But if you look behind it, you often find that there's some hidden cause or some more important factor that was uh, at work. I mean, my favorite post on this, and I don't think I have the link to it, is, um, yeah, but maybe I can add it later, is um, I, I think it was called The Superpowers of Ben Bernanke. And it was back when he was being blamed for the increase in tortilla prices in Mexico. And uh, I did a little research and found a mystery variable. It was perfectly correlated with QE. And um, what it was was the hours of daylight in Central Park. And so what was happening is everything was going up at the same time. But if you just looked at the two charts, um, you would get completely the wrong impression. So... What do I read every day to help? <clears throat> One of the things I do is I write a weekly, my weekly column weighing the week ahead where I read hundreds of things and pick out what I think are the best to highlight as the week uh, goes along. Abnormal Returns is a great site. And uh, I, I don't know how many things that I've picked up or new sources I've gotten from, from mm -hmm. reading that source. And Wednesday is now turned into Personal Finance Day. It's especially useful. Advisor perspectives I read every day uh, to see what other advisors are thinking, what they believe is important, and that highlights key research. Uh, a few years ago, I started reading the FT in addition to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the FT, of course, does well on the United States, but it also is great on foreign coverage and especially Europe. And then I have a feed reader that lists a bunch of blogs that I think are important. And I look at all of those each week uh, as well. So uh, that's the kind of reading I do. I watch CNBC with TiVo and it on mute. And then if I see somebody that looks like they might be saying something significant, I can scroll back and listen to it. Uh, so that's my plan. And I try to... Uh, I try to guide people to the right thing. So if, if you get out of the, the mainstream with your sources, that's another way of getting edge. Uh, I don't spend much time reading Zero Hedge, but I get a lot of things sent to me where somebody says, I, got, I saw this chart, and it looks like the world is going to come to end in two months. Uh, is this really right? And then so I'm aware of what's being said, and I can analyze the chart. Um, another another thing, by looking at good biotech sources, um, you know, we know there's this big debate over drug pricing, and they're easy political targets. This is where political science knowledge helps. I mean, I guess you can predict that whenever there's another story, we're going to have a tweet from Mrs. Clinton and a bunch of other people will chime in. So eventually, I believe that the drug pricing will be determined by people that want to maximize the impact of dollars spent for health care. And sometimes, and I use Gilead as an example, uh, you can pay $50,000 and cure somebody of something in a couple months, or you can pay much more than that but stretch it out over several years. And eventually, But that doesn't fit very well into a sound bite. So if you take specific knowledge of science and specific knowledge of the political process, you can put them together and draw some contrarian conclusions. Uh, tools are good. Everybody that wants to do their own stock picking should read Chuck Carnivale. Um, we use Y charts in our office. It has a bunch of variables. 
that you don't see anywhere else. We decided to buy regional banks, and this was the main way we found all of the key criteria we thought were important for regional banks. So a combination of looking at data and looking at fundamentals and ignoring noisy sources, I think, is really the key to finding edge through sound contrarian investing. Thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, I can't emphasize enough um, the quality, the consistent quality that Jeff has displayed online. If you follow him on Seeking Alpha, um, you'll see that he's very patient and professional when he answers economic questions. And that's one of the things that you know I, I rely very heavily on Jeff's work um, simply because he's shown he's, he's better than I could ever get at this point. He did a great piece yesterday, for example, on employment, had a little quiz, and I, <laughs> I realized where I was on the food chain. <laughs> it wasn't very high. Um, but anyway, I want to uh, move on um, from Jeff. And if you do have questions, uh, we, do, we do get them. We'll answer them at the end. I'm going to give a, a chance for Mark Gerstein to jump in. And Mark, a little bit of background. And, and we met 30 years ago. I, I hesitate to ask. I'm too young for that. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, Mark and I have known e each other a long time, and I'll give you a, a softball pitch uh, to introduce yourself. Mark has written about the importance of knowing your sources, and this is a consistent theme underlying some of the, you know, reading the news effectively. You know, if you take somebody like Brian Gilmartin, who's done this for 15 years, look at corporate earnings, or Jeff, who's written, you know, 1,000 articles on Seeking Alpha and has answered 10,000 questions, okay, maybe they might actually know something, um, Mark, who has done bottom-up research, you know, for forever, if he's going to go out and build a model on, you know, on what variables you should look at and what it means when you build screening tools, which is what he does with Portfolio One Two Three, maybe it's worth listening to. So, uh, with that, Mark, um, you know, a little bit of background and uh, how you look at the market. Okay. Um, well, I originally started out went to law school. I'm an attorney, also. I uh, actually just got the huffing and puffing back from court before I got on the call. Uh, but I got into uh, finance, you know, back at a time when the legal job market wasn't so hot many, many years ago. Got my MBA in finance, went on to Value Line, where I met some little smart aleck kid named Rob Martorana, you know, the guy with the big mouth. And, that would um, be me. Yeah, that would be him. And was there for a long time. I ran a junk bond mutual fund while I was there. We called it aggressive income because we were too good to say junk bond, but it was still pretty junky. Um, then I went to a company called Market Guide, a little dot com that was acquired by Multex, that was acquired by Reuters. M&A looks a lot more fun when you're writing about it from the outside than when you're inside. Uh, now I'm at a company called Portfolio123, which used to compete with Reuters in stock screening and ranking. And that's where I still am. Uh, as the first slide says, I'm basically model-driven. So I'm, my favorite reading really are the 10Ks and 10Qs. I'm, I'm a geek. I like them. What can I tell you? Um, one other thing, before I get into the main part that was, occurred to me as the previous presenters were talking and something Rob just led into, I think one of the most important things you can do with any article you click on anywhere click on the name of the author and figure out who's writing it. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have, like with Seeking Alpha, people like Jeff Miller. You have the Brian Gilmartins of the world. You also have a lot of people. I once clicked on an article on Seeking Alpha. Apparently, the author was a stand-up comedian who was doing this as a hobby. I never read the article. Yeah. Um, then uh, I don't know if uh, others who aren't Seeking Alpha have seen this contributor notice that they're asking contributors if we know people who can, they're looking to hire people to go out into college campuses to recruit students to write articles. I mean, that's all well and good, but there's a difference between reading Jeff Miller and there's a difference between reading a college freshman looking to earn his weekend's beer money. I hope I don't have to explain why. <laughs> so we really check on who's doing the writing, and it's a very important too because, again, this as something Jeff said, you don't make money on what happened yesterday. We have to, all we can do is take the present and the past and use it to make assumptions about the future. It's all opinion. You might as well try to get the best, most informed opinion you can find. Uh, now, as to how I handle it, uh, the next slide, sure. um, which I just didn't click on. Here it is. 
on economics, the economy is obviously very important. It's the backdrop for everything we do, whether we like to admit it or not. Um, Robert mentioned FRED, which is the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. It's their data, I guess it's their data library. You can set up a free account. The charts they give you, on it's amazing. It's everything and anything. You can format the charts the way you like. I like the big long point of view. I don't want to know what happened to housing starts compared to the last month. I want to see a big picture that goes back decades. And ditto for everything. I want to see big picture. That's very important to me. I can get these at a glance. And it takes me about a few minutes of doing this, my pre-saved charts, and I can get my view of the economy. And it gets me off and running as to what the big issues are. Uh, the news media will write about the same thing, but they don't do big picture. They do the immediate picture. And, you know, the narrative may make absolutely no sense. Maybe it will make sense. It's luck. Uh, if we can go to the next slide here. Okay, the basic t topic of today is the news. Again, I'm a big picture guy. Most of what I do is model driven. It's based on the data. So when I look for outside sources of news, I want the overall context and the setting that helps me on the bigger decisions. And as soon as I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do, maybe a little mic and mic on ESPN Sports Talk Radio, but then when I want to get serious, Washington Post and New York Times. Every day those are my big ones. And not, probably the one section I don't read from either of them is the finance or business section. I want to know what's happening in the world. And The Economist on weekends, I consider an absolute must. So Saturday or Friday, whenever I can get that on my Kindle, I just go right through that. That gives me the overall setting. Again, what's happening? Now, having worked for some time at Reuters and having worked one floor under with all the reporters work on, you know, the people at the wire service, I pretty much learned how the sausage is made and how these new stories get created. And it helps me really get through things very, very quickly. You start with the head. Oh, before we get into something, Rob had commented that if you see a story that goes against the political leanings of the news organization, something is broken out. I have a different spin on that. It means that hmm. the unemployment statistics are rising because somebody just got themselves fired. These news organizations have their political leanings. It's just that simple. And you can always tell what it is by the headline. Um, company XYZ posts its best quarter in two years. Or earnings plummet at company XYZ. These are two different ways of framing a headline on the exact same earnings release. Yeah, it could be down, but it could be down the least over in X number of years. So you can interpret a lot from the headline. It means something. Then there's three parts of the story. There's the first part which supports your premise. You're usually going to have to get some quotes, some sources, attributions that support the story. Um, and then you're going to have to get some quotes on, on the other hand. Uh, I remember back in 2002 when the market was you know, really at its bottom and everybody hated analysts and thought they should all be in jail. When it comes to how, you know, the market's really kind of at a bottom and looking good, I was always the, other, the on the other hand quote down at the bottom. I never got to be the top quote. The top quote was the analyst should all go to jail. And then you have the wrap up at the end. If you understand that sequence, you can kind of look for things before you even read the story. And you don't have to go through it all. You also understand the inverted pyramid. You start with the most important things and you work your way down. And they, the reporters call it inverted pyramid because they assume that most people are not going to have the time to read the entire story. So they write deliberately on that basis. So this is pretty much how the sausage is made. Um, what's the next slide? Um, okay, recency bias, and this is something that really makes me a little crazy. I find, and this drove me nuts because I worked at dot-com companies. I tried to talk myself to death with this and went nowhere. The business model that these websites are designed under is that everybody starts the morning sitting at their terminal, stays there all day looking at the same screen, watching stories scroll, just like in the old days people used to sit in brokerage offices watching the ticker tape, and they never leave their computers and never leave the screen all day. That is the model that they assume is correct. We all know that that's absolute nonsense. People have things to do. 
And we've been hearing on the call how people parse their time, read the news. We heard how Anonymous pulls something together, you know, once a week with his sessions. It's murder for people like that, and that's why he has to go create these files because the, the financial media is not helping him at all. They're happy mm -hmm. to have things scroll off in five minutes. So you really have to learn to hunt for things. Um, the theme, or a random theme, I think uh, Jeff Miller touched on this. Um, you know, people get on CNBC who have a good relationship with the producer, and he also used the phrase, who make themselves available. Don't <laughs> underestimate the importance of make yourself available. You know, it's nice to get a call from the producer, but if you're busy and you can't be in at the studio the next morning when they want you, or you can't do it at this hour, that doesn't help them. They favor the people who are there, and I don't know what that tells me about the people who are on more is like, well, why do they always seem to have time to be there? It makes mm -hmm. me a little nervous. Uh, the tabloid practice to simplify and exaggerate, absolutely. The media are not there to help you invest better. They're not there to help you be more successful. They're there to get you to click on their pages or to watch their network so they can charge higher rates to the advertisers, period, the end whether they're wrong or not is absolutely irrelevant. In fact, I've had this out with somebody who was, well, actually he used to be one of the head editor at Seeking Alpha, and now he's the CEO. When I complained about some of the quality of what was there, they don't care. It's actually good for them to have bad articles because they can get thousands of page views as people in the forum argue about it and hash it out, and quote, unquote, the community evolves the, the reality of the article, what's good and what's not. And, you know, that, but that's, that's the world we're living in nowadays. Uh, not very optimistic, but as you can see, I'm not a great fan of the news. So I read it very skeptically, very much with the numbers. Others here on the call have said it. Mm -hmm. It's the data above all. Oh, and Bryant, well, I would much rather read you know, what Brian has to say about earnings. I don't want to know what uh, anybody on CNBC has to say about earnings. Brian collates it. He makes sense out of it. CNBC just wants to get you outraged so you'll keep viewing long enough to get to the next commercial and preferably come back after the commercial from the tease. Um, so that's basically how my, I approach the news, very skeptically, very cynically, because I know how it's made. Always check with the numbers, the boring things that nobody wants to read, the 10Ks, the 10Qs, in my case often as filtered through CompuStat, because we are model-driven, uh, data-driven, so I, we use CompuStat. I depend on them very heavily. Um, what's the next slide? I think it's my list of favorite sources. Uh, yes. And, and then we're going to have to – I want to give Ed a chance. Right, okay. Yeah, have well, a lot I'm, of good stuff. Yeah, um, let me just accelerate because of that. Yeah, monetary velocity. Uh, you could read me on Forbes today. I touched on it, so uh, let's just go ahead. I don't want to take up more time. And when you download on the next slide, you'll see all my sources. One of my favorites, and I think the most underrated one, is Twitter. Um, you know, I have two accounts. One account I use to follow you know, New York Jets players that I like to follow, but the other one is my business account. The Economist, every news organization that I consider worthwhile, it's a great way to get one stop, all of the articles you want. You can click on them and get into the article. It's what RSS, really simple syndication, should have been if people like me could have figured out how to make it work. So really don't underestimate Twitter if you follow the right good sources. And I'm going to turn it over. No, thank you, Mark. And I can't emphasize enough uh, something Mark said many times, that the, he's very focused on data um, and charts because you can count on it. The narratives, not so much. And he, he said this, reading too much is counterproductive. I'm not kidding. That If you read too much and it's from bad sources, it puts bad ideas in your head, and you will make bad decisions. I don't care how smart you think you are. If it's garbage in, garbage out. I uh, wish we had more time to go into that, but I hope it's self-evident. Um, um, Ed Stavetsky, um, and any, uh, we may not have time to do all the questions. We don't have that many questions. Just contact me directly after the call. Google, write Blend Investing, or Rob Martirana. All my contact info is public. Um, and Ed Stavetsky, um, you know, if you could give a little background, Ed, and um, Take it away. Okay. Uh, been in the business for about 30 years. Had, uh, ran uh, hedge funds, mutual funds, uh, value-based investor for a lot of years, uh, which is how we arrived at most of what we did. We take a very skeptical look at pretty much everything. Uh, 
don't look for what goes right and look for what goes wrong. Uh, the old saying goes, bull markets make geniuses out of everybody. Uh, you know, when, when the markets are going well, you can throw a dart and you'll pick it and it'll go. But you've got to look for see where the potholes are. And it's always, it's never where you see it coming from. It's always out of out of the out of the blue, and uh, you know, and people you know, talk a lot about data and you know, and adjusting the data and looking and you know, and interpreting the data. Um, you know, if, if you play with numbers long enough, they'll confess to anything you want them to look at. And really, mm-hmm. what you, you need to do is just uh, uh, you know, try to understand what is what is going on. Is, you know, it's talking right now. Unemployment, 4.9%. Employment's great. Economy's good. Well, why aren't wage, why are wages going down? Food stamps, people going up. Something is structurally wrong in there. Uh, you can't have one percent GDP growth with full unemployment. Uh, so you know you ha- you, you got to start looking for what things may go wrong, and uh, and you go you have to really see what's going on. Uh, take a, take a really a balanced view on, on what's going on. You know, you talk about you know. Warren Buffett's a great investor, but he's also got the best PR machine in the world. Um, and, and, and so you need to look behind a lot of things. Uh, Warren's done great on investing, not so much on tax policy and, and, and economic advice, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> talk about the, you know, the different websites. Uh, you know, I, look at, I, I want to see where the potholes are. And, and let's hear Mark Faber, Rogers, Casey, Jeremy Grantham. Um, Jim, these, these are all curmudgeon and old men. Uh, you know, who's, who's seen a lot of things, <laughs> and uh, you, you know, know what what go what could go wrong. They they look a lot of different things. You know, like I said, and I look at things like you know, there's a lot of uh, you know what they call now prepper websites and gold bugs and and all this. Most of it is is, is garbage. It's you know, it's really you know the tin foil hat crowd. But in, inside some of those, you'll see starts that that are cracks. We have uh, our, our our function right now. We do a lot of asset allocation work, sector uh, analysis for our, for clients, and uh, you know we had been in and out of gold over the last several years. And people said, well, you know, gold's not an investment; it doesn't pay anything. Well, I would argue that uh, you know if you put a five or ten percent allocation of gold into a portfolio right now, five percent five percent position in a money market fund that pays 001 percent isn't much different. And the other side is that the money market fund never goes up. Gold will. Uh, it just on, on where you put it. You know, another one that came out was you know, all of a sudden this, the the government is arming itself for what? Uh, you know, they talked about all these different departments were were buying millions of rounds of, of ammunition. Um, so the, the, they're expecting some kind of issue. Back in 2012, we wrote about. Uh, the biggest concerns going forward were food, water, and uh, uh, violence and, land. Cha- and, ca- and chaos. And you're mm-hmm. seeing problems with, with food supplies right now. Water is certainly a, an issue. And you're starting to see unrest all across the globe. Uh, and, it, and it's certainly being played out in the elections here. Uh, whether, whether or not you yeah, – who, who you care to vote for, it's really not going to uh, – uh, and in a very happy way, you see, you, you see a lot of the articles you even seen that people are angry and people are upset about things. It is going to have an impact on the investment markets, uh, no matter what that economic data says and what the other earnings are going. People are unhappy. There is going to be some issues, I and mean, you need to prepare for that. Like I said, uh, the downside. Uh, Rob and I wrote it. Uh, remember back in I think it was after the 2000, 1999, 2000 tech crash. If people were invested in, you know, the markets are going up forever. Everything's great. Doesn't really matter what the valuations are. Um, but all of a sudden, it crashed, and, and the people who were going to retire within five years all of a sudden didn't have anywhere near the money they had because they didn't see it coming. And that's the, what you really have to um, have to focus on from a political standpoint. From a glo- you know, you got to be. We're in a global market. There are things that are going to impact here, maybe short term, maybe long term. Uh, some of the best, you know, best Ian Bremmer, Strategus, uh, Eurasia, Central and Central Bank notes. The, the, the Federal Reserve Board and the central banks all across the globe are just a font of information. Even you know, even the IMF and the World Bank, uh, you can get a lot of studies, a lot of information uh, on them. 
and it's free. Uh, that, that's the best part. Uh, Jim Grant is another one. And Jim Grant's another. He fits into the you know curmudgeon old old man. He's you know there, there's never been a market that he's liked, um, <laughs> and he's he hasn't been writing uh, probably a very long time. But uh, a lot of things that he does point out eventually come to uh, uh, fruition, and so you you see uh, uh, what what what's going on. But the one thing, the key, the, I think the, really the last piece here is that you have to have an independent view on the markets or the media is going to force on you. Uh, I think Mark talked about, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, they've got their view. All right, they do. And so you know what it's going to be. Uh, most of them do. And you, you can't let, you got to dig down, you got to see what's on the other side because uh, you're always going to find happy talk on the markets. And and you'll also find you know the negative side, but you'll see people say, uh, they dismiss it automatically because mar- stock markets always go up. Everybody knows that until they don't, and then and then that's when the that's when the real problems begin. So that's that's it, Rob. No, thank you, and I apologize because um, I didn't want Ed to feel rushed. Um, so I uh, you know I could. Uh, could have done a better job as a moderator there. Uh, Ed has the, one of the key points that Ed has made on our calls is that, and this is an area of disagreement within our group. Let's say that a source, and he mentioned like the great ammunition myth, uh, that that was something that na- what the National Review called, you know, all these groups arming themselves. Um, okay, the source was was sketchy. Um, yep. Their background and their track record not so good. Maybe even politically biased. But that doesn't mean that they're not true. You have to look through it. You, you go into it very skeptically. But certain people, certain groups are extremely motivated to find things. So even and, – and you're reading the news in that manner. In fact, almost the opposite of what we argued at the front um, where we were talking about how to read. Like, you know, we fo- I follow Brian because he does a really good job on earnings. Um, on stock screening, I like Mark's work. But it doesn't mean you only look at people who are credible. You look at people who are sketchy, but you look at them completely differently. It, it is a very time-consuming process. It's a very different process, a very different way of looking at the news. And I hope that that came out of um, what Ed had said. I, I do want to um, answer a couple questions that came up very quickly. One from Felix uh, Vermet. He asked about fact set. Is that going to show where money is moving to and from? Um, capital uh, flows, net flows in mutual funds is covered uh, better at Lipper. We look up Tom Rosine at Lipper. He covers flows, net flows into bonds, stocks, and every category of market. Personally, I've done a lot of work on that. I feel that net flows are indicative, not just of existing sentiment, but they can sometimes be predictive. It's a big topic, but I would go to Lipper for that. They have, uh, my experience, best data. Um, another comment we had was, you know, I, I agree with Jeff on, you know, CNBC. I've often wondered where they get their experts. Um, I guess they just pulled over somebody on the subway train sometimes. Um, what, what are the effects of the DOL ruling on 401ks? That's the new fiduciary rule. Uh, beyond the scope of this call, but I will say, you know, we may handle that in the next call when we talk about robo-advisors and, um, you know, fee-based fiduciaries and stuff like that. Will it be a windfall to financial advisors? Uh, no, actually the opposite. What we're seeing is a lot of fee pressure on every part of wealth management, uh, from advisory to hedge funds to, you know, any type of active manager. Uh, but within this group, we, we do not hold to strong market efficiency. We do believe that it is possible to add value through active management. Um, you know, that's, you know, other people may disagree with that, and uh, just thought I'd have that out there. If you have any questions, uh, please type them in. We, we should have about one more minute left, and then I, I think the call it will disconnect in five minutes. So uh, if you do want to type in a question. Uh, but before we do, uh, Brian, Jeff, uh, any or anybody, uh, any of my co-presenters can jump in with anything at all. Thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll second thank that. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we do hope to make this uh, an, uh, an ongoing uh, presentation on different topics, the CFA Institute, 
and Bright Talk. Uh, I'm collaborating with both of those. They're both very much interested in this idea of respectful disagreement. And Bright Talk on October 12th has. Uh, we will be back um, on October 12th with a discussion about respectful disagreement and the investment process, uh, which is a complex topic. You know, how do you disagree respectfully? Um, I got to tell you, when I when I ran a website at thestreet.com, and some of us were there then, uh, Jeff and Ed and Brian, uh, the bulls and the bears wanted to kill each other half the time, and it was Texas extremely cage difficult. <laughs> yes, cage, that's, and and a lot of issues would come up like, well, you know, do you have to be of a certain level of experience and knowledge to be in this group? Because I'm embarrassed because so and so is factually inaccurate. And I can't stand it. That that was a, like a tough. And I was a moderator, so. Um, also, you had the people, technical analysts versus the fundamentalists. <laughs> te yes, technical versus fundamental. There's no love lost between those groups. Um, comment came in. My my favorite quip uh, is when clients ask me about something I saw on CNBC, and then I ask them if they think doctors watch General Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's like you know I I look at WebMD it doesn't make me a doctor um you know you watch CNBC and you get some pop economics and some pseudo analysis it, it does not make you an mm -hmm. investor um, it's your money if you want to go and do it yourself that's fine but but the people on this call you know run their own companies and we're fiduciaries. Uh, we're responsible for other people's money, and we just can't wing it, go to Vegas, put it on red, and say, you know, sorry, no retirement for you. Um, we actually are accountable uh, to people. So I'll um, – uh, we're overrun. We have a two-minute countdown, so uh, if there's any other comments, great. Otherwise, uh, we'll we'll close the call. Rob, thank, thank you again, Rob. Thank you again, Rob. Good. Yeah, thank you, Rob. No, thanks, everyone. Uh, appreciate your time, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again uh, in October. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.